Hi, I'm Gavin. Um, this is our presentation on fractals, uh, Jackson Pollock, and MC Escher. Okay, uh, fractals. They are geometric figures. Um, they consist of patterns um, where each part is pretty much similar to the other. Um, say, say if you zoom in on one part, it pretty much looks like the figure as a whole. Um, the idea behind fractals is that, is that they are um, self-similar, um, which pretty much means that you know if you zoom in on any part of that fractal, um, it always looks the same uh, no matter what. Um, fractals can be completely natural, uh, like you know trees. We see those every single day, um, or they can be mathematically generated um, on any uh, you know fractal website. And uh, also, there are people out there who have created um, these mathematical fractals. Um, the more fractal is iterated, uh, the more detailed it is. Uh, these are some natural fractals. Um, as you can see, this is kind of like a river with uh, creeks coming out of that. Um, you can see how, if you were to zoom in, um, you would be you would see this uh, this process repeating on this tree right here. The branches continue to branch out into little parts of like twigs and stuff, and then on the pine cone, uh, that spiral keeps going uh, nonstop, you know, until it's just you know teeny little teeny spiral. Go ahead. Um, yeah, and this is kind of like a visual of how these patterns repeat. Um, as you can see in the pine cones, you can clearly see the pattern, and then on this pine or the pineapple, this pine cone is a spiral. It, shows, it clearly shows a spiral. Um, these are some mathematical fractals that people have invented. Um, up here we have the Cantor set. Um, you know, you can see how you take out the middle third, um, and then you continue to take out the middle third, and it, can, it continues on forever. Uh, right here, this is a Serpensi carpet. Um, and if you zoom in on that, if you were to zoom in, you know, it would, it would continue. Same thing here. This clearly shows it. Um, you know, you keep zooming in, and it, in the uh, process, it's just ongoing. Um, an iteration is just a process repeated. Um, so like in the uh, Cox Snowflake here, um, if you were to keep iterating, so this is one, two, three, four times, um, it becomes more detailed. And so if you were to zoom in on this, um, you, know, you would continue to see that, that repeating snowflake. So the next person we're going to be talking about in our presentation is MC Escher. So M.C. Escher, he was, um, Rita's C. Escher, was born in Leowarden, Holland in 1898. He was the son of a civil engineer from an early age that saw in Rita so that he had a big um, interest in architecture. And so later on in life, he enrolled in the School of Architecture and Decorative Arts and studied there from 1919 to 1922. Um, while, his there, while he was there, his interest began to change more from architecture to drawing and painting, which he was very good at. And so his influence that helped um, him make that change was his teacher, Samuel Jesse Ryan Nicholson. And in 1924, after school, he married Janita Inker, and they moved to Rome to start a family. And so um, what he's known for, he's known for his various sketches, paintings, lithographs, wood carving. And a lot of his other work. Um, he was left-handed, like some very, some very famous artists, like Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, and countless others. Um, a lot of his sketches they were based off of buildings and possible constructions that were very detailed and would be really hard to construct, especially during that time period. And so, like some of his work here, like we have up and down. A lot of his. Um, Art uses different perspectives. So you have the upper perspective in it of this um, building here, of this house, and it goes from the upper perspective. And then it also links to the very top of it in the beginning, you can see, and then shows the, another view of the house. And then over here, you have one of his more impossible constructions that are very detailed, very precise, and that would be hard to construct, especially back. And so, like I said, a lot of his um, use different perspectives. So here you have relativity in 1903, he created, and um, he uses different.
different stairways that go all different directions that show people traveling in many different ways all around the same area, but it just shows different aspects and different perspectives and views of what's happening. And then in his three spheres here, this is the second one he does, um, it shows a different perspective, more the perspective of someone as if you were looking at them, what the news is in the center of this of Mars. Hi, I'm Em. And our project is on fractals, and my part of the portion of the project is Jackson Pollock. Okay. Who was he? Paul Jackson Pollock was born on January 28, 1912. He was born in Cody, Wyoming. He was known as an American painter and very influential during the abstract expressionist movement. That's art. People referred to him as a very quiet and antisocial man. He was also an alcoholic. Okay. His art. Okay. Well, Pollock was most famous for action painting. Action painting is a form of expressionism where the artist forcefully paints with the rapid strokes on a canvas. His art was inspired from Native American Navajo sand painting. So when back then he observed he observed sand painting, that's where he got his ideas from. He was also inspired by Picasso, Miro, and the Surrealists. Here are some of his um, paintings that he did that are most well known. This one up here, here, and here. These are three of like, one of his one of his most famous works. Fractals. Fractals are a never-ending pattern. They are shapes that go on forever and can sometimes confuse the mind. They are a complex pattern that are similar across different scales, and they have they repeat many, many times. All right. So how is how is art related to fractals? Well, Pollock strip painting paintings contain fractals. And these images have degrees of complexity, so they have, like, in a way, they have degrees of certain. Um, uh, fractals are, again, repeating patterns that have mathematical concepts, and they also have fractal dimensions, which is which stands for, which is D, as you can see here. Okay. All right, Paula continued. At first, not many people acceptable accepted Pollock's work due to his imprecise images. So at first, people just looked at it as a bunch of um, just paintings and dots and stuff. Um, he inspired many people around the world for his use of porny and action painting techniques. For years, Pollock has struggled with alcohol alcoholism. On August 11, 1956, Pollock died in a car accident while drinking under the influence. He was 44 at the time of his death. So in this video, we will show you exactly how fractals work. We hope that by the end of this video, you will understand fractals and how to use them in solving problems. Um, we found a clip to better explain uh, fractals and how it relates to Jackson Pollock. And I'm going to show you that video now. Uh, yeah. smaller scales, creating natural patterns known as fractals. They are found throughout nature's design, in everything from trees to river systems. And while scientists continue to study the manifestation of fractals in the natural world, one researcher has turned his attention to their presence in a different realm, the artistic mind. Nobody knows more about fractals at the University of Oregon than physics and psychology professor Richard Taylor, who directs the university's fractals research program studies the presence of natural patterns in our work. I sort of started life with a fundamental dilemma of, uh, you know, what sort of uh, career I'm going to go in. Am I going to go into science or art? And I really couldn't decide. I went the scientific route initially and got a PhD in physics. And then I uh, took some time off and went to art school and got a, a master's degree in art. Throughout his life, Taylor has been captivated by the creative mind of his favorite painter, Jackson Pollock. Taylor's fascination with the late abstract artist led him to remarkable
discovery in 2004, when he and his team began searching for the fingerprint of nature, a subset of Pollock's elaborate drip paintings. So we scanned uh, the images, very high uh, resolution images of Pollock's work, into a computer, and then used all of these programs that we use to actually quantify fractal patterns, to actually show that Pollock's work has all of these fractals embedded in all of these sort of swirls of pain. For years, art historians have described Pollock's paintings as organic and natural, despite their seemingly chaotic appearance. Taylor's discovery was an important step in putting the science behind his descriptions. The whole art world was very excited about this, and um, a lot of scientists uh, could see the potential as well, because it was the first example of explaining art using science, and so it's a sort of new territory opened up for the scientific Alright, so I hope at the end of this video you kind of get a better understanding of Jackson Pollock and how his art relates to our math mathematical concepts and our projects. So